Hi, this is Duncan Ferguson. In uh, this unit, we're going to talk about the main uh, causes of calcium disorders, calcium that as it goes up or down. And uh, the review of these disorders is a really good way uh, for you to review the physiology uh, that's been discussed already with regards to uh, calcium and phosphorus metabolism and the effects of PTH, uh, vitamin D, activated vitamin D, and calcitonin. So let's take a look first at what causes hypocalcemia, and it's important to distinguish um, reduced total calcium, which can occur uh, just because of reduced amount of binding protein, the main binding protein being albumin. So in animals that have hypoalbuminemia, might be due to uh, GI loss or, or, or renal loss or blood loss, uh, you can see a lower calcium, ionized calcium, uh, lower total calcium, but not ionized calcium. So that's why from a clinical standpoint, it's always important to measure ionized calcium where possible. Uh, Decreased calcium deficiency, uh, dietary calcium de deficiency, uh, especially when there's excess of phosphorus in the diet, can cause hypocalcemia. Um, lack of vitamin D, either due to dietary uh, reasons, uh, like rickets, or in severe renal disease where the kidneys are no longer activating vitamin D, uh, this can cause hypocalcemia. Usually it takes pretty severe renal disease before this occurs. And then, of course, the lack of PTH, which can occur as a spontaneous disease, and we call hypoparathyroidism, uh, is an acquired inflammatory glandular problem. Or, perhaps more commonly, uh, when we do a thyroidectomy, for example, in a hyperthyroid cat, we are, uh, and we don't do a good job of, of preserving the external parathyroids, there are two of them, and preserving them can be by putting the parathyroid back, even under the skin, even if the blood supply is disrupted. Uh, this will cause um, a low PTH and hypocalcemia as well. So as an exercise, let's take a look at what happens when the body is particularly challenged by a great need for calcium, such as during lactation, like a dairy, a dairy cow. Uh, so if you get, at first, a reduction of plasma calcium, it's the first uh, response to this will be an elevation of PTH. Um, that elevated PTH will have its effect in its three places. Uh, let's start on the left. It will reduce the renal tubular reabsorption of phosphate right here. It will increase the urinary excretion of phosphate and it will decrease the phosphate concentration. Okay, remember that's what PTH does. It decreases phosphate. Now at the bone, it will, and this is important, it will, uh, PTH will increase bone reabsorption, and that will increase calcium that can be released into plasma. At the uh, kidney, uh, the effects on calcium is to increase renal tubular reabsorption, uh, therefore reducing the excretion of calcium, and that helps to contribute to the plas increasing or restoration of the plasma calcium here. And then a, uh, an effect that occurs within the kidney is, of course, the activation by PTH of 125-hydroxyvitamin D. Uh, and this increase, vitamin D, will increase the intestinal absorption of calcium, which also contributes to restoring the plasma calcium. Um, that note that vitamin D and PTH interact where calcitonin has no role, plays no role in a response to hypocalcemia. Now let's turn the tables and look at the causes of hypercalcemia. Well, the first thing to, to say is that hypercalcemia is almost never in fact, is never caused by a deficiency of calcitonin. Uh, it's also rarely due from calcium ingestion. It's a, calcium give, administered uh, orally is a very safe thing to do. The main uh, adverse effect that you can see is, is sometimes constipation. V hypervitaminosis D, that is uh, vitamin D excess, uh, or whether it's uh, giving too much uh, from a therapeutic standpoint, or an animal eating vitamin D by mistake, um, you can 
uh, see this elevation of calcium uh, and that can be confirmed as a, a source, oral source, by measuring 25-hydroxyvitamin D. Uh, we can have naturally occurring uh, both primary and secondary hyperparathyroidism. Primary hyperparathyroidism is basically usually due to adenomas, in the dog at least. Adenomas. We um, can also see secondary, um, both renal, and we'll talk about that in the next slide, and nutritional hyperparathyroidism. And what these would be is that PTH is responding, elevated and responding to the perceived reduction of uh, calcium uh, availability. Then we have, which is actually the most common cause of hypercalcemia, at least in small animals, is what we call pseudo-hyperparathyroidism, where uh, we see a variety of neoplasms, particularly in people and in dogs, um, occasionally in cats, will produce um, a molecule that looks like PTH, and it's called PTH-related peptide, PTHRP. It acts like PTH, uh, does all the same things as PTH, interacts with its receptor, uh, but it's not measured by the PTH immunoassay. And so uh, this can lead to uh, an elevation of calcium and all of the things you'd expect from hyperparathyroidism, except PTH itself is not elevated. And then the final thing you can see is that you can have excess bone resorption uh, of calcium that can occur with neoplastic or inflammatory processes that uh, invade the bone. So let's talk about vitamin D toxicity that's not uncommon, particularly in small animals. Um, and in this situation, um, we have all the three tissues uh, leading to an increased calcium. And what does that mean? We have um, the gut uh, is increasing its absorption of calcium, uh, the bone is increasing its resorption of calcium, and the kidneys are increasing reabsorption of calcium. So both, all of these lead to an increased ionized calcium. Well, what we worry about in the animal with such hypercalcemia is an elevation of the calcium times phosphorus uh, solubility product that when it's uh, definitely when it's, this is greater than 60, you can get um, soft tissue mineralization. And that soft tissue mineralization um, is going to lead to damage to tissues like the kidney, particularly. And the kidney, of course, and it's damaged, it's difficult to recover. So what do you do when you have an increased calcium um, that's due to any cause? Uh, well, you can antagonize the absorption of something like vitamin D at the gut by giving glucocorticoids. It will have a redu redu reduction of the calcium absorption. You would acutely want to give uh, sodium-containing fluids to help exchange calcium with sodium in, and lose calcium in the urine. Um, and you can also give calcitonin, although that's a very uh, expensive drug. And there are also drugs that will help to slow down the bone reabsorption um, uh, in response to the elevated vitamin D action. So the most important one, uh, when you're dealing with calciums that are quite high, they would be, say, above 15 milligrams per deciliter, uh, you should uh, be concerned about the kidney and make sure you uh, keep the animal well hydrated uh, and diurese the kidney and with a sodium-containing solution. So in this figure, we're going to kind of review all of our understanding uh, of the various players, calcium phosphate, PTH, um, and vitamin D in particular, as it relates to disorders that we see uh, in animals. And so let's, let's uh, you should be able to rationalize these as we talk through, tr talk through them. Uh, hypoparathyroidism, that is reduced PTH, that's the primary problem right there, will lead to a reduction of calcium and phosphate. 
okay? And because PTH is active, uh, role to activate vitamin D, uh, 120, that is stimulate the one alpha hydroxylase, uh, you will have reduced vitamin D, uh, 125 vitamin D. The precursor vitamin D, which is mainly uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D, is only going to be dependent or changed to, uh, if the source of vitamin D, say in the diet, uh, is altered. Now, turning the tables, primary hyperparathyroidism is, a, for instance, an adenoma or occasional carcinoma that makes too much PTH. Well, remember what that does is it increases ionized calcium and reduces phosphate. So it, it has the opposite effect on phosphate, uh, vitamin D. Um, of course, by act, PTH activates vitamin uh, 125 uh, hydroxy vitamin D, and the 25 hydroxy vitamin D shouldn't be changed if the dietary source of D is adequate. When we have the primary problem being the PTH like peptide, PTHRP, produced in pseudo hyperparathyroidism, such as with malignancy, of course, in this case, the PTH effects are mediated by this peptide. And when you measure uh, native endogenous PTH, it's going to be reduced because guess what? Its effects are being handled by this. Uh, peptide being produced by, say, a malignancy. But you'll see all the other effects the same as if it was primary hyperparathyroidism. You have increased calcium, lowered phosphate, and increased activation of vitamin D. Now, what happens when the kidney will fail? And uh, as the kidney fails, its role in making activated vitamin D will start to fail too. And so that's why here, we get a reduction of 125 hydroxy vitamin D, even though there's adequate amounts of its precursor coming from the liver. Well, what this does is it lowers ionized calcium and it will uh, increase phosphate, but that effect is uh, in, in large part uh, due to the increase of PTH. So PTH is being uh, well, phosphate will be increased largely because of the kidney disease. Uh, PTH will be elevated because it eventually detects the ionized calcium going down. Uh, and that's why we call this secondary renal, renal secondary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, in the previous slide, we talked about vitamin D toxicosis. And so the only thing I'll mention here is that this is the scenario where we measure 25-hydroxy vitamin D to sort of confirm that the D the um, excess calcium, uh, hypercalcemia, is associated with excess uh, sources of uh, uh, nutritional or ingested vitamin D. Otherwise, all the other things we described in the previous slide. But what about D deficiency? Well, with D deficiency, of course, you're going to have lack of intake, so that uh, 25 is going to be down. You're going to have lack of activation because there's not enough to be activated even though PTH is uh, sensing uh, the problem, which is a lowered calcium, ionized calcium, and a lowered phosphate. So um, in vitamin D deficiency, if you uh, needed to diagnose it, you would probably make that diagnosis by measuring either 125-hydroxy vitamin D or 25-hydroxy vitamin D. So to summarize our discussion of calcium disorders, uh, hypoalbuminemia can lead to a reduction of total calcium, and this is sometimes uh, mistaken as true hyper hypocalcemia, uh, but don't let that fool you. You should always confirm such a finding with an ionized calcium measurement. The deficiencies of calcium and or vitamin D or the absence of BTH can cause a reduced ionized calcium. Hypercalcemia can be caused by increased PTH, uh, increased uh, PTH-related peptide made by malignant, uh, malignancies, and by vitamin D, but almost never is caused by an increased dietary intake of calcium uh, because that is a fairly safe thing to do, or by reduced calcitonin. Uh, the 25-hydroxyvitamin D, which is made by the liver, 
uh, in a relatively unregulated way. It's an excellent indicator of vitamin D adequacy, particularly if it, by given uh, uh, nutritionally. And overall, if you look at the previous table, we talked about careful monitoring of ionized calcium, phosphate, PTH, and 125-hydroxy vitamin D can allow you to characterize most calcium disorders.